Yes. Okay. All right, great. So thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And also thank you, of course, and, and Nico for uh, the opportunity to speak. So today I'd like to talk to you guys about um, a couple of projects and ideas that I've developed over the course of my PhD, of course, in collaboration with my advisor, Michael Cole, but uh, also in collaboration with a number of my lab mates uh, at Rutgers University. And so the central ideas surround uh, understanding the role of the computational role of brain network organization, particularly as they pertain to cognitive processes that can be accessed with uh, task manipulations. And so first to link uh, the ideas that I'll show later on on brain network organization with uh, the central theme of the seminar series, kind of reserve, I first want to define a uh, kind of reserve as um, the ability to cope with pathology and or age related changes to perform cognitive functions. So an active area of research uh, to understand kind of re uh, reserve is understanding its neural implementation. And so there have been a number of, of works looking at uh, networks such as task invariant networks by Jakob Stern et al, who gave a nice talk last week, um, in which they identified a set of co-activated regions across multiple different tasks that correlated with individual differences um, in kind of reserve. And so this, this notion is not dissimilar from other notions of task positive networks, such as the multiple demand network or the front of product control network. And so one idea or one theory um, or a hypothesis from my advisor is that the interplay of uh, pathology or harmful dysfunction with uh, control system capacity or uh, the network integrity of, of these networks really will determine the manifestation of cognitive symptoms. So say for example, you have high amounts of harmful dysfunction or pathology, uh, yet low amounts of control system capacity, you might manifest severe amounts of cognitive symptoms. Now in contrast, if you had high amounts of control system capacity, you, you may be able to mitigate uh, those symptoms to only manifest um, some mild psychopathology. And then other notions as well uh, that might correlate with cognitive reserve are, is the notion of, of neural efficiency. So this is the degree of task activations or the, the magnitude of these task activations with the main idea being that uh, regions that might activate more uh, due to a task are likely deemed to be more neurally inefficient. And so in many of these cases, uh, we're using task activation patterns or task co-activations uh, to understand the neural correlates of kind of reserve. Uh, but what I want to share with you today is the idea that uh, the network mechanisms that produce task activations uh, likely lie in brain network organization. So if, in, if indeed the hypothesis is correct is uh, that task invariant networks likely implement or correlate with cognitive reserve, uh, it's likely that brain network organization may actually mediate uh, these differences in task invariant networks or the manifestation of these task invariant networks. All right, so with that, um, I just wanna to outline the two main points I'd like to make today. Um, the first is addressing the question of how network organization mediates the production of cognitive task activations, right? So in this way, we can look at how networks actually might compute uh, activations through modeling activity flow in data. So the general idea, I'll go into this figure in more detail later on, but the, the general intuition is that we can predict the activity level of this region, uh, J in purple, by estimating the amount of activity flow from other regions mediated by any kind of connectivity weight. So in this case, we're using uh, resting state functional connectivity, but in principle, any kind of connectivity model should work. Um, and then the second main point I'd like to make is uh, addressing the role of cortical hierarchy in mediating uh, cognitive processes, right? So there's been a ton of work that has looked at uh, the functional heterogeneity um, such as uh, specialization and flexibility of different brain areas. And so what I wanna look at here is the, the, these influences on, of, of heterogeneity on local and distributed processes across the brain, right? And so a canonical example of hierarchy or cortical hierarchy is from the Spellman and Vanessen paper in 1991 in which they revealed a structured hierarchy uh, as determined by anatomical wiring in the macaque cortex. So, uh, down here you have more visual areas or input areas and up here you have higher order association 
fourth chains. All right, so just to start with the first point. So I want to contextualize uh, or first ask, um, why does a brain region activate during a task? So a standard approach to understanding uh, why a brain region activates or what a function of a brain region is, is to map function or task conditions onto structure or the activity of a brain area, right? So we can map these different conditions, uh, the presentation of a face stimulus, uh, the presentation of a play stimulus onto the activity or time series of a given brain area. But I think if you were to ask most people uh, what determines the function or what determines the activity of a given brain area, it's likely to be connectivity, right? So if we, if we notice that, a, uh, or when we see a neuron spike, uh, that spike likely influences the membrane potential of downstream connected neurons. And so what we wanted to do uh, is to merge these two ways of thinking uh, by using both a combination of task manipulation as well as connectivity mapping. So for example, if we want to understand the function or activity of a region X, what we can first do is map out its connectivity uh, identify its uh, connected regions or its upstream regions, and then in turn address what uh, task conditions do those regions respond to or activate in response to. Um, and so we tested out this um, framework uh, using this activity flow mapping idea or concept in which this directly allowed us to test whether or not the activity of this brain area in J could be predicted as a function of both the co its, connect its connectivity as well as the responses of its connected regions. In other words, if we want to predict the activation level of this region J, what we can do is estimate the task evoked activations of these other regions in blue, and then compute the linear weighted sum weighted by its intrinsic FC to this region J. So this would describe the amount of activity flow between brain areas that is mediated by some, some sort of connectivity weight. Ultimately, what this pr provides us with is a method to predict task relevant neural activity across different brain areas uh, using connectivity models. All right, and so just to illustrate what this looks like in practice, um, say, for example, we want to predict the activity level of this green region here. What we first do is map out its, its whole brain connectivity. So this is a seed-based uh, connectivity uh, map. Uh, we, just to be clear, we actually don't use uh, correlation, but instead use uh, multiple regression uh, to ensure that we partial out the influences of other brain areas. And then what we can do is, is then look at the actual activation pattern for a given task, uh, so a motor task. And so of course, if we want to predict the activation of this green region, we would exclude this area in this uh, motor task activation. And then what we can do is uh, perform a element-wise or voxel-wise multiplication to generate a map of the activity flow estimates to this green region of interest. And so if we were to sum those uh, activity flow estimates across all, all these voxels, we would get a predicted activation level of 3.6 for this green region. And so then in this case, the actual activation is 4.7. Um, one thing to note is that the units of these activations are somewhat arbitrary because uh, they are determined by um, the standard, uh, standard task GLM coefficients or, or beta coefficients in a regression model. All right, and so we can do this process iteratively for every brain area or for every voxel in the brain. And so this yields, or this provides us with the whole brain um, vertex-wise or voxel-wise brain activation pattern. And we can compare that with the actual activation pattern uh, for that same task. We can compare the similarity and, and uh, find that it's highly similar. And then so the two main take homes of this uh, demonstration is that first, uh, resting state functional connectivity can predict task coactivation patterns. And second, uh, these regional task activations reflect a distributed process. In other words, um, that, uh, that green region's task activation is actually a reflection or can be explained by a reflection of the activations of other brain areas. Uh, so I wanna emphasize that this process or the success of this process or this modeling did not have to be the case. Um, in other words, 
activity flow modeling in, in these functional empirical data requires the assumption of uh, distributed brain processes. In other words, we ran a bunch of computational simulations of large scale uh, neural mass models. And we varied the network parameters to vary both the amounts of inter-region coupling, so the, the, the coupling between large brain areas, and the degree of self-coupling or, or local coupling uh, with each brain area. So this is the, the inter-region coupling is on the y-axis, or it's other, otherwise called the global coupling. Uh, and the self-coupling is on the x-axis referred to as uh, local processing here. And so what we find is that in general, activity flow mapping only works in this parameter regime. In other words, activity flow mapping only works when there is strong inter-region coupling relative to self-coupling. <clears throat> and so within this framework, we can begin to ask um, more nuanced questions such as how might information actually be transferred between two pairs of brain areas. So say for example, we have some pattern of activity or some voxel pattern in V1 that contains decodable information to, with respect to some, some kind of stimulus or task information. So in this case, we can consider an example in which uh, this pattern of information reflects the presentation of a red visual stimulus. And say for example, we have a secondary brain area uh, such as V2 that also contains decodable task information. The question we want to ask is whether or not we can map activity from a source region to a target region such that decodable information is preserved. In other words, is there a function from V1 to V2 that we can estimate uh, to, to preserve information between those areas? And so we can extend this, this framework of activity flow mapping to just ask, whether or not this process can predict the voxel activation pattern between two distinct brain areas. So again, if we want to predict some region B's uh, voxel activation pattern, what we do is take the voxel activation pattern of some other source region, A, and estimate the voxel to voxel resting state functional connectivity. And so when we have that uh, voxel to voxel functional connectivity matrix, we can perform a simple matrix multiplication where we multiply the vector of voxel patterns in A with this resting state functional connectivity matrix. This creates a predicted activation pattern for region B, which we can then subsequently assess whether or not there's information in that region. <clears throat> right, and so we, we devise a procedure to, to, to assess whether or not our prediction actually contains information in, in this downstream region B, right? So where we take region A's activation pattern project it onto uh, region B's uh, voxel pattern or spatial geometry. And then because region B is solely a, pre a prediction based off information from, re from region A, we can compare that with region B's actual activation patterns across different conditions. In other words, another way to think about this is we train a decoder uh, on these predicted patterns where we then decode the real activation patterns for that same region. Um, so in this way, our, here's another uh, visualization of, of the same principle or same idea. The general idea is we take some pattern of activity in an ROI in yellow and project that into the spatial geometry of this green region, uh, which yields a prediction for that green region. And so I don't want to go into uh, too many of the details of these specifics of the uh, um, experimental paradigm. But the general idea is that what you're seeing here is the percentage of successful transfers using patterns of activity in this colored region onto all other brain areas uh, in this atlas, right? So this is the percentage of successful transfers from, each re from these regions. So this is what it looks like for a particular task type or task rule, so uh, logic rules. This is what it looks like for sensory rules. So sensory rules are a bit sparser and you can see that transfers come from a different set of areas, primarily visual areas. Um, and there, there are some dorsal attention areas here. Um, and then also for motor rule transfers, they are more spatially localized uh, to come from motor cortices. But in any case, the, the, the main take home of this study um, is that uh, we can map task representations between brain regions using 
network estimates from resting state data or connectivity estimates from, from resting state data. And so one particular study that I'm, I'm particularly excited about, um, it's not quite out yet, I'm hoping to have it out, uh, or plan to have it out this summer, uh, is that we can begin to understand or address uh, cognitive computations in terms of network computations. In other words, if we take two distinct pieces of information, so for example, during a, a context-dependent task, sen sensory stimulus information with task context or task rule information, we can ask where in the brain do these two distinct pieces of information mix to generate the conjunction or the conjunctive representations of rule and stimulus. We can then take it further and project these new conjunctive representations onto the motor cortex to predict the correct motor responses for a given trial type. Uh, so in other words, we can apply this activity flow framework to do a multi-step process, so multi-step activity flow uh, predictions to generate uh, a prediction of sensory motor transformations during a context-dependent task. And so I think this would give insight into the nature of cognitive computations, but implemented neurally. All right, so just to summarize uh, this first part, um, the first take home is that we can map task representations between brain regions uh, using resting state network organization. The second, the second point is that functional connectivity uh, as an idea can be thought of more as, uh, or can be used to understand exactly how information is encoded and decoded between pairs of brain areas. In other words, if we have information in a given brain area, uh, that information can be decoded by some downstream region or downstream brain area using the connections between those two areas. And then finally, uh, and more generally, uh, this uh, reveals the computational relevance of brain network organization in cognitive processes. And, and it certainly, uh, I think, reveals the, the functional relevance or the functional importance of of resting state networks in producing uh, task activations. All right, and so now to move on to this second uh, point I'd like to make, the role of cortical hierarchy. So uh, there is a longstanding history uh, in neuroscience that compares and contrasts uh, the differences in localized and distributed functioning across cortex. Uh, so one, Old example from 1931 is this paper from Carl Lashley uh, in which he advocates for the notion of decentralization or mass action in cerebral function and that this this uh, notion of decentralization need not uh, involve an abandonment of recognized uh, physiological principles or existing known facts of localization. Yet fast forward about 60 years later Horace Barlow uh, wrote this paper um, in which he still advocated for the, promote, uh, the approach to brain function at the level of individual neurons. And he referred to those who believed in analyzing and investigating neural assemblies or mass action to be those uh, uh, of an unenlightened opposition. And so personally, I don't think these two perspectives are necessarily at odds, but I do think it does provide some uh, good context to understand exactly uh, this dichotomy of localized and distributed function and how hierarchy might play a role, right? And so more recently, there've been a number of studies, of course, this, this canonical example of hierarchy uh, from, from Feldman and Vaness in which they show uh, anatomical hierarchy through uh, anatomical track tracing in, in macaque monkeys. Uh, again, uh, more input early areas or lower order areas are down here, and these connect up to higher order association areas uh, up here. And, and using more modern imaging techniques, um, others have shown that this anatomical hierarchy uh, can be captured or estimated using myelin maps. And th this myelin map is uh, effectively the contrast between the T1 or T and T2 uh, structural MRI images. Um, and there's a pretty strong correlation between uh, these types of wiring diagrams with uh, these myelin maps in the cats. And then other notions of hierarchy include uh, more functional types of hierarchy, such as uh, this time scale hierarchy, which was estimated in uh, 
electrophysiology data in, in monkeys, in which they found that lower order sensory areas tend to operate at much faster intrinsic time scales versus higher order association areas tend to operate at much slower uh, drawn out time scales. And so what we wanted to do was extend uh, these previous notions of hierarchy to investigate differences in localized and distributed function uh, in cortex using human task fMRI data. And so just to operationalize uh, exactly localized functionality, we, we performed a task activation analysis across uh, many different tasks. So we use the HCP data set, which contains uh, seven different tasks, but a collection of 24, in total, a uh, collection of 24 different task conditions. And so how we operationalized local, localized processing was if, if a region consistently had strong activations, the magnitude of those activations were strong, so we, we just looked at the absolute value, we didn't care about the sign. Across these 24 different task conditions, we would determine those regions to, to reflect more uh, localized processes. Um, now to juxtapose that with uh, more distributed functionality uh, or localized and distributed functionality, we performed a task functional connectivity analysis in which we directly compared task functional connectivity with resting state functional connectivity. So for each brain area, we would ask, would its average functional connectivity Increase, uh, be reduced. And so, um, so the average functional connectivity is more commonly uh, in graph theory or network science referred to as uh, also the weighted degree centrality or uh, global brain connectivity. In other words, if a region tended to reduce its functional connectivity during tasks, we would uh, infer that that region was performing more of a, a localized function. And so the general intuition for that is that if, a, if the correlation is reduced in the brain area, um, in some sense, it is segregating itself from, from the rest of the brain. And so uh, using these definitions, we can, uh, we can estimate both the task evoked activations average across these 24 different conditions and also uh, um, estimate the task FC change for each brain area separately. And if we were to just directly compare these two brain maps, we would find that they are negatively correlated with each other. So here dots refer to each brain area. The Y axis is the FC change or task FC change and X axis is the task activation change. Right, and so the main take home here is that localized and distributed processes are negatively correlated in the brain. Now we wanted to relate these more task related or task evoked differences in uh, across cortex to more traditional ideas of cortical hierarchy. And so one such proxy or representation of hierarchy is this paper by uh, Daniel Margulies et al. in 2016 in which they identified several different large scale gradients from resting state data. And in particular, this first gradient uh, spanned or existed on, existed on a continuum from, from unimodal areas such as the visual and somatomotor areas up into the default mode network um, and frontal parietal networks. So in effect, it, it transitioned from a, a unimodal to transmodal setting. And when visualized on the surface, this principal gradient or this gradient one here uh, definitely had, uh, indeed had high, um, high weights or high principal gradient weights on uh, visual areas and motor networks while having negative weights on uh, association and default mode networks. Uh, just to be clear, these, these weights are also arbitrary because they are somewhat similar to uh, the component weights on a, a PCA analysis. Um, and now, so we can, we can directly compare uh, this principal gradient with our task activation and, and task FC change maps. And so what we find is that when we compare task activations with this principal gradient, they are positively correlated <coughs> versus when we compare this task FC change map with this principal gradient, they are negatively correlated. And so uh, two, two observations. The first is areas with stronger task responses or stronger task activations are lower on the cortical hierarchy on average. And that areas with more FC reductions on average are also lower on the cortical hierarchy. And overall, the, the one uh, striking observation is that uh, these task activation maps um, 
are data that's collected in, totally independently of uh, this principal gradient data, which is estimated from resting state data, which is uh, task-free. And just some other observations. So we also compared these differences in localized and distributed processes to um, other notions of hierarchy, such as the time scale hierarchy and myelin content. Right? And so this is the intrinsic time scale hierarchy that we estimated from resting state fMRI. Um, and this is uh, the regional myelin content that we took from this previous paper. And so one thing to note is that, is that um, you could probably see by eye that these two brain maps are anti-correlated. Um, so for example, visual areas tend to have a very fast or low time scale versus uh, temporal areas tend to have a, a slower or longer time scale. Um, and this is, uh, there's an opposite relationship in, in this myelin content map. Uh, and I should just briefly say that these, these notions of hierarchy correlate with uh, the other notions of hierarchy, uh, the differences in localized and distributed processes uh, that I described earlier. And so finally, one other um, approach to uh, assessing distributed processes in the brain is through this activity flow mapping framework that I um, uh, described earlier. And so the general intuition of of why this works is that activity flow mapping explicitly tests whether a target region, so this region J, uh, its activation can be predicted as a function of other brain areas. In other words, a, a, re, a brain region is predicted as a, as a function of a distributed process. And so what that means is if we want to assess whether or not J contains more of a distributed versus a localized process, what we do is generate a prediction for this region J for a given task condition compare it with the actual task activation in J, and then estimate the, the prediction error. And so we can do this for all the different task conditions uh, in the HCP data set. And so collectively, we can uh, generate an average absolute prediction error for this given brain area. And if there is low error in this brain area, we would determine that the prediction is doing well. And so therefore, it is, uh, that region reflects more of a distributed process. Versus if there's high error, we would say that that region uh, looks to be more of a, a local process because there is activity in there that cannot be explained by activity flow from other areas. And so in this way, we found that task activation uh, changes or the degree of localized processing was positively correlated with activity flow MAE or mean absolute error. In other words, localized processes were harder to predict yeah, active flow mapping, right? So the converse of that is that uh, higher order transmodal areas contain more, or appear to contain more distributed activity flow processes. And so just to um, really briefly summarize this part, the first is to point out that there is indeed functional heterogeneity in localized and distributed processes across cortex, and this is evidenced by the task activation and task state FC analysis across uh, 24 different task conditions, and that these uh, differences in localized and distributed processes obey a previously established hierarchical cortical organization that span from unimodal to transmodal areas. Uh, and then finally, that uh, through the activity flow modeling framework, uh, we can predict or illustrate that uh, uh, lower order regions yield worse predictions, uh, worse activity flow predictions. And so some outstanding questions. Um, the first is that uh, it's unclear whether or not fMRI bold activation and FC changes are actually good proxies for local and distributed processes. Uh, and the second is whether or not these findings would generalize to a wider variety of tasks such as, such as uh, naturalistic stimuli or naturalistic paradigms. And then finally, and perhaps uh, the most interesting to me would be uh, understanding the exact causal structure of hierarchical functional organization. In other words, uh, what are the necessary and sufficient biophysical mechanisms that leads to this differentiation of local and distributed processes? And to bring that back to uh, the two main points I, want to, that I wanted to make, I just want to summarize these two points. Um, so the first take home is that task activations are mediated by distributed brain network organization, which we can estimate 
uh, with resting state fMRI. Uh, and then the second is to just acknowledge the, the functional heterogeneity across cortex. It's not all uniformly, uh, not all brain areas are uniformly distributed. Uh, and that future network models um, will need to account for this, these differences in functional heterogeneity to provide better accounts of cognitive functioning and better accounts of, or better predictions of cognitive task activations. Uh, and finally, now to, just to summarize uh, and bring this back to the original theme, I hopefully uh, convince some of you that that brain network organization or the intrinsic organization of the brain likely mediates the manifestation of, of task invariant networks that have been previously used to study uh, the correlates of kind of reserve. And again, to highlight this idea um, from my advisor, the, the idea is that if you have high amounts or the interplay of, of dysfunction or pathology with control system capacity uh, likely leads to different outcomes or manifestations of, of psychopathology. Right, so if you have high amounts of, of Alzheimer's related pathology, for example, uh, yet low amounts of uh, network integrity, you might manifest severe symptoms versus if you had instead high amounts of control system capacity, you would be able to, to mitigate uh, symptoms that you actually observe. And so one, one nice example uh, of these ideas played out in practice for clinical applications is from a lab mate of mine uh, Robbie Mill, um, I had no part in this study. But the general idea is that by using different functional, uh, resting state functional connectivity matrices across different clinical groups, um, you can predict the outcomes of different types of, uh, or you can pr predict the activations of different clinical groups, right? So uh, you can predict the dysfunctional age related task activations from really small resting state network alterations. All right. And so um, with that, I just want to say thank you guys. Of course, I want to thank my advisor, um, Michael Cole, Horacio Rossin, my thesis committee, um, of course, my lab mates, my external collaborators. And for any of you who are on, on social media, I encourage you guys to check out these hashtags. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, good conversation and information in these, these threads that I think can um, help address uh, racial inequities in my field. So, thanks. Thank you, Jackie. That was an uh, excellent talk. Um, so, it's now open for questions. Uh, please come forward and um, unmute yourself and activate your um, camera. Okay, if there's no immediate question, um, then I will um, just uh, jump at the opportunity. Thank you. So, um, your model of uh, information transfer, um, how does it actually determine when, you know, an information transfer uh, was efficient or successful or not? I mean, do you have any quantification of that? Um, right, so I guess in, in this case, um, if I can go back to the figure, uh, actually, Uh, the general idea is because we're directly comparing the, pr the predicted pattern of activity uh, in this region B mm -hmm. with the actual activation pattern uh, of those region of Bs, we're ensuring that the predicted information is transformed according to the, sh the correct and actual uh, geometry of region B's activity. And so we're just effectively just decoding a training a decoder on predicted patterns of, of region B uh, and then testing whether or how well that decoder can actually decode the real patterns of activity in, in region B. Um, of course, it, it's unclear how well in practice or in other words, how spatially similar region B's prediction is to the actual, uh, but we can still train a decoder to accurately train this or to actually predict uh, correct uh, predictions of region B, of the downstream region. Okay, so according to that interpretation, prediction error is noise and information lost. Is that correct? Prediction error. Um, so, so, 
Can you explain what you mean by prediction error? So, uh, so you're actually you're predicting the activation region B based on A, right? And yes. Of, yeah. Um, right. So there, there certainly is information loss, and um, one thing to note is that it's an assumption that region A and region B contain uh, the same, t exactly the same types of information, right? So, for example, if you go back to the example of uh, transfer between B1 and B2. V1 presumably has a much higher dimensional representation of the stimulus versus V2 and even down to V4 and IT, you have much more compressed representations of that first initial stimulus, which it might be compressed into, for example, into IT cortex, it's an object code. And so that's a much lower dimensional, it's a, in some sense, uh, a lossy compression or information compression uh, downstream. And so what we wanted to address actually in this uh, follow-up paper um, here was the quality that, or an example that we can predict the transformation of different types of information into a qualitatively new type of information. So when we perform a task, or even say, for example, when we're walking in the street, when we see a red light, we need the context that if we're at a, at a pedestrian stoplight, the red light means uh, to stop. But as soon as that light turns green, uh, the stimulus changes and therefore we implement our task context and tell ourselves to move. And so in this way, um, what in this study we're doing is combining or looking at exactly how we can combine both sensory representations with task rule representations to generate a new motor uh, representation. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Oh, there's, um, there's actually uh, a comment where the chat function. Oh. Do you see it, uh, Takuya? Um. Let me just read it to you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Do you control for the distance between your predicted region and the predictive uh, regions? And how do you uh, cross validate? Right. So, yes, we, in some sense, we do control for the distance. So, um, Anytime we're predicting a given brain area, we're excluding the vertices or the voxels that lie within 10 millimeters of the border of that region. Um, and so any, so in theory, any kind of spatial autocorrelation should be removed. Um, and so the way we cross validate is that we actually, um, we predict trial by trial. So we take the activation patterns of one trial, project it onto another brain area, and then we actually predict uh, the activation the at the real activation patterns of all different trials. So trials that are not actually temporally um, locked to each other. So in some sense, there's two types of cross validation. It's uh, predicting out of set because you're predict predicting a different brain area, but you're also predicting a different trial. Um, the actual cross validation sc scheme is. Uh, I don't, I don't remember the actual, the actual K-fold, but it's a K-fold cross-validation where we train on some number of trials and then test on some held out trials. The, de uh, the decoder is a, it's a distance-based decoder. Okay, thank you. Mm. Anybody else? Okay, if not, just uh, let me make one uh, last announcement. So uh, we are planning for a future session uh, focusing on um, racial differences um, in cognitive and emotional uh, resilience. So if you would like to present, contribute, or have any ideas of, you know, how to uh, shape the format of uh, such a uh, session, please uh, just uh, email me, find the, my email address in the Google Doc of um, the schedule. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you very much. And um, hopefully see, to, uh, see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.